Uh, well, I'm delighted to be here. It's, uh, it's a great, uh, it's a great event for me. Uh, last time I was here at the University of Maryland, I was here for the Duke basketball game. That was a great night. Uh, and I probably met some of you that night. I was sitting down on the court next to Steve Bashotti, and you, I was one of the guys who trampled <laughs> rushing the court uh, that night. Um, when, I, when I come out to speak to students, I like to talk a little bit about our owner to begin with. Um, Steve Bashotti uh, bought the team back in 2000, um, and he was, went to Salisbury State, graduated in 1982, thereabouts. Um, and I will tell the story because he would tell it himself. He, he, didn't, he wasn't exactly a great student. Um, his first boat that he bought, his first yacht, he named it C Student, as in the letter C. <laughs> and I think he was exaggerating his grade point average. <laughs> um, and so there he go. He comes out of college. Uh, you think the unemployment rate is bad now? Well, it was the same back in 1982, about ten, a little over 10 percent. Um, he couldn't really find a, a job, so he went to work for a temp agency. Um, and he was basically selling the service of the temp agency to companies all over the Washington area. Uh, temp agency went bankrupt. So he calls up his cousin, uh, who, who is a very smart, talented financial guy. Um, they borrow $10,000. They buy the company out of bankruptcy. That was 1983. Starts his company. When I met Steve, uh, when I was representing him and buying the team uh, in 1999, by 1999, it was the largest uh, privately owned company in the state of Maryland. It was really bigger than that because they had a couple other companies that didn't, didn't want anyone to know about. And he, they were so quiet about their success um, that uh, at the time, the largest investment banking firm in the Mid-Atlantic region, at least in the Baltimore region, uh, was Brown, uh, Alex Brown, which was a great investment banking firm, since been acquired a couple times and largely disappeared. <clears throat> but Alex Brown is a company that took many, many Maryland companies public. And Art Modell, who was selling the team, hired Alex Brown to represent him in finding a buyer uh, for the Baltimore Ravens. And he had never heard of Steve Bashotti or his partner, Jim Davis. So that's how quiet they were. Their offices were probably 10 miles from Alex Brown's office and no one knew about him. So the, the only point of this story uh, is by the time I met him, he was already a, a billionaire and on Forbes' list. And so, you know, you may be a C student. I don't know what kind of student you are, but look at Steve Bashotti. Um, before I actually start talking about the Ravens, what I'd like to do is just to show a very short video to wake everybody up a little bit. And also, just to, this is the kind of video we use around the office. This video was actually used in a meeting we had with our uh, salespeople at our radio, local radio partner, local um, television partner, and trying to pump up their sales guys to get excited. We showed the video. We brought in the head coach who can really get a crowd going. He can certainly get our players going. And I think it was successful, but uh, this, is the kind of, this is the kind of video we use around the, around the facility. <laughs> All those words you see in that video are things we talk about at, our, at the Ravens a lot. Uh, we try to use themes and words that the team is using as well. So there's a lot of signs around our building with those words and other words like it to try to get everyone psyched. We try to stay in the same wavelength with the players and the coaches. Not always easy. 
Uh, we're kind of a unique organization in that our building, um, which the Baltimore media calls the castle, uh, was built by Steve when he got control of the team in 2004. It's a beautiful NFL facility. But we all, we all have offices there, so it's not, there's no division between the business side and the football side. We all eat our meals together. Uh, during the season, we sometimes have to stagger meals for the players, but in the off season, when most of the players are there, we all eat together. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good relationship for, for the business people, but also for the players. They get, they get to interact with a lot of people in the building. I think it brings us together in a way that a lot of other organizations don't. And it's, it's difficult in a football team to try to break down the barriers between uh, football and non-football. And we, we make a lot of efforts to do that. Now let me talk a little bit about the Ravens as a business. Um, because we are a business. We're a, we're a strange business. And I'll talk about why we're a strange business. But let me talk a little bit about our business. In many respects, we're like any other sort of medium-sized business. Uh, we've got roughly 140 full-time employees, not counting our players. On game day, when you come down to our stadium, we'll have another 3,000 or so uh, part-time day workers who do things like take the tickets, their security. Uh, we have police. We have fire. We have people in the parking lots. But our hardcore workers, 140 uh, full-time people. Um, we're not a big business. Uh, total revenues will be roughly $250 million, which in, you know, and you're going to be hearing from a lot of business leaders, and you have heard from a lot of business leaders who generate you know, four or five, ten times that. Um, but while we're in many respects like other medium-sized businesses, there's some ways we're very, very different. And part of those differences arise uh, really from the NFL rules we operate under and our collective bargaining agreement. Um, the NFL rules really structure how an NFL team is owned. Uh, in, in, under NFL rules, there's no public ownership. We can't sell shares to the public. There has to be one person, and it cannot be a corporate entity, it has to be one person who owns at least 30% of the team and has 100% of the voting control. And that person can have limited partners or non-voting partners, but they cannot exceed 15 in number. So it has to be very small. Um, there's a, when you go to buy an NFL team, as Steve Bishotti did, there's a debt limit. Uh, an NFL team can have no more than $150 million in debt. And that debt includes not only debt of the team, but also any debt that is, that is secured by an owner's ownership interest in the team. So it really means if you're going to go buy an NFL team, you have to have a lot of cash, or you have to have a lot of assets away from the team. Um, the, the Miami Dolphins, for example, sold three years ago for $1.1 billion. You could only borrow $150 million against that. So it really means that anyone who buys an NFL team has a lot of cash or a lot of very liquid assets that he can borrow against. Um, and when you go to buy or sell an NFL team, it has to be approved by the league. And what that means is that three, there's 32 teams. You have to get three quarters of the owners to agree with the purchase. And that's true of all of our NFL rules. All NFL rules have to be approved by a three-quarters vote. Any large contract, like a television contract, a national TV contract, has to be approved by three-quarters of the owners. So those sets of rules really, really limit us and govern us, and uh, I think actually are what make us quite successful. The other key document we operate under is the collective bargain agreement. And that's the agreement between the league and the players' union. And uh, we've had a structure with the union in place Going back to 1992, we negotiated the system we essentially have now. The numbers have changed a little bit, but we, we put in place a salary cap uh, back in 1992. And um, that salary cap uh, has worked, I think, to obviously to the league's benefit and also obviously, I think, to the players' benefit. And that cap, and I'll talk about the labor situation as well, but that salary cap and the collective bargaining agreement is a critically important document to the NFL. <clears throat> The other thing the NFL rules do is they require extensive revenue sharing among teams. Now, we're 32 competitors, and we compete vigorously on Sunday, and we're going to compete Sunday night against the Steelers. But in reality, we're also, we also cooperate. And it's a rare business where 32 competitors actually share their revenues, but that's what we do. Revenue sharing is extensive. Uh, the largest source of revenue in the league are national revenues from the national television contracts national sponsorships, direct TV, and all that money, to, regardless of the size of your market, all that money is shared equally 32 ways. Our gate, our tickets, we share our ticket receipts. Um, 
every dollar, every dollar of ticket receipts the Ravens get, we, we send 30 cents to the league. That 30 cents is then put into a pool, and we get one thirty-second of the pool back. So if you're a team like the Ravens that has relatively high ticket prices, higher than average, and you sell out your stadium every week as we do, we put much more into that pool than we get back. But that enables smaller revenue teams to, uh, to compete. Uh, we also have something we call supplemental revenue sharing, which is a special revenue sharing pool for low revenue teams. It's about $110 million. The higher revenue teams have to put money into that, and it goes to the low revenue teams based on a formula. We, the Ravens contribute money into that uh, each year for the last, uh, since we've had it really for the last four years. Um, and what, what all of these things really do for us, um, you, you really end up with a system that, that is competitively balanced. And that's the secret, I think, of the NFL's success. Uh, when you look at baseball, you look at basketball, uh, or even hockey, the big market teams, the high revenue teams have a tremendous advantage. Uh, it's really not true in the NFL. If you look at the teams that do well, they're not necessarily the large market teams or the highest revenue teams. With the revenue sharing we have and with the salary cap, uh, it's, you, you really are able to compete regardless of the size of your market. Um, by the way, the salary cap, there's also a salary floor. So you can't be like some baseball teams that, that makes, make a lot of money but don't spend it on their players. Under the NFL rules and under the collective bargaining agreement, the salary cap is one number, the floor is 90% of that number, and you can't be below that 90%. If you're below that 90%, it's roughly 90%, it's, it's more complicated than that, but it's roughly 90%. If you're below that, you actually have to distribute cash to the players, your own players at the end of the year to make it up. No one's ever been below it, but it is there as a, as a, as a, as a barrier to, to, going, to going too low. Um, the popularity of the NFL right now is really pretty amazing. Um, if you look at, I mean, you can judge it in many different ways, but if you look at 2009, 13 of the 15 highest rated television shows in 2009 were NFL broadcasts. The top 14 cable shows were all NFL broadcasts. Um, the last year's Super Bowl was the most watched television show in the history of the United States. 153 million Americans tuned into the Super Bowl. I mean, this year, the numbers are still really strong. Through, through week 11 of, the, of this, the current season, um, it's so far, it's the most watched regular season in the history of the NFL. Um, been 11 straight weeks where the highest rated television show has been an NFL broadcast. Um, the regular season ratings this year are up 18% over 2008. The other issues that, have, that has faced us is the recession. And uh, I'll talk about the Ravens and the recession a little bit, but in terms of the NFL, um, you know, in 2008, when the recession, recession began to really hit companies, the NFL office in New York City laid off 10% of its workforce. A lot of teams uh, laid off their workers. Uh, teams are not hiring people right now. We hire players, but generally we're not hiring other people. It's just people are worried about what's going on. Uh, around the league, uh, season ticket sales this year are down 5%. Now, part of that is the fact that it's, so, it's such a great experience now to stay at home and watch on a flat screen, high definition television, that some teams are having a harder time getting fans to come to the stadium. But, but it's affected everybody. Uh, recession has also affected teams in their local markets by cutting back on corporate hospitality spends, the skyboxes, the suites, uh, the premium seats. If you're a company that's laying off your workers, you obviously cannot go sit in a, a suite at a stadium and pay $175,000 for a season of sitting in the skybox. So around the league, there's been a lot of uh, reduction in spending on suites. Third big issue, I think, affecting the league as a whole really relates to uh, re what I would call revenue disparity. What I mean by that is even though we have all this revenue sharing, you've seen the, the stadium in Dallas go up, that palace, cost $1.2 billion to build that stadium. Uh, that's generating enormous amounts of money. And while the Dallas Cowboys are already one of the highest revenue teams, they've now gone to another level. The New York teams built a stadium in New York that cost $1.6 billion. Uh, and that's generating enormous amounts of revenue. And uh, you're really seeing, you're beginning to see some differences in teams to the point where you, you our, our whole revenue sharing system is getting stretched to the point where you begin to worry about uh, parity and competitive balance, which in turn is what really, I think, drives the success of the NFL. It's an issue we're going to have to address. Um, <clears throat> let, me, 
Let me talk a little bit about Baltimore and how the, how the Ravens fit into all this and, and how at least we, we view our team. I think we are, uh, Baltimore is a, is a small market. We're the 26th largest media market in the country. And we define Baltimore as a media market. It's really the city of Baltimore and the five counties around it. So it doesn't include PG County or Montgomery County, but it's essentially Baltimore County, Anne Arundel, Howard, Hartford, and Carroll County. Uh, the reality is, though, we share Howard and Anne Arundel County with the Redskins as a practical matter. It's our territory. It's our television market, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. But the reality is Baltimore didn't have a team for 13 years. And when we were gone, when there was no team here in Baltimore, uh, the Redskins gained a lot of momentum in those, ter in those counties. And so um, that's, you know, it's just a small, it's a small market for us, made even smaller by the fact that Washington is so close. Right where we are tonight, we're roughly 30 miles from our stadium. And yet this is not our, our market. There's no other team that has that situation in the NFL. Um, but in 2009, in terms of revenues, we were the 10th highest team in the league out of the 32. Um, Forbes, for what it's worth, says we're the eighth most valuable franchise. I, I don't really agree with that, honestly. They have us ahead of Chicago, which is really silly. But anyway, they put us at eighth this year. Um, when you measure how you're doing as a team, I think, in your own market, every business, business measures it differently. One, one thing I look at is how are we doing our own market in terms of fan engagement? Are, are the fans looking at us? Do they care about us? Uh, and so we, there's a couple measures that we've looked at recently. TV ratings in our local Baltimore market. Um, we're up, and I, I use 2006 sometimes as a comparison, because sometimes your fan engagement can be affected by how badly you're doing or how well you're doing on the field. 2006, we were 13-3, and three, the best record the Ravens have ever had. We got a first round bye. We did lose in the first, we did lose to the Colts in the playoffs. But we were the number two seed that year, 13 3, a really good record. Uh, so I use that as sort of a benchmark about how we're doing. So this year, this season, our, rate, our television ratings in the Baltimore market are up 24% from where we were in, in 2006. Um, around the NFL, and I don't have the numbers for 2010, but in 2009, uh, we, we were the uh, we were the 10th highest ratings of the 32 teams in the NFL. So that's, uh, that's good. That's very good. Our website, you know, we've spent a lot of money and time on our website because that's a way you can engage fans. Uh, the idea is to get them to come to your website, stay on your website. So we've hired people, put a lot more video. We've made a substantial investment in the website. And I think it's working for us. Uh, 2006, we had 3.6 million unique visitors. Uh, 2009, we're up to 6.3 million. 2006, we were the 31st team in the NFL, 31 out of 32 in terms of unique visitors. Uh, last year, we were number 18. So we're, we're making progress there. You look at Ravens Rookies. It's a, it's a club we run for kids. You pay a little money, you get to join, you get some little, little benefits, and it's a, it's a fun deal. Um, takes a lot, it's a lot of effort to put that together. We have, a, we have one guy whose job is really to run it a lot of other, other people support it. 2007, right after our great season, we had 2,400 members. Now, now in 2009, we're up to 9,000 members. Purple membership, uh, we, we've made an effort to try to attract more women fans. And we started something called Purple, which is a, a club. We, we're not allowed, I think, to say it's just for women, but it, it, women, I think, feel more comfortable. And uh, we had an event at the stadium this year for purple members, and I think we had, what, 6,000 women there, maybe 20 men, I don't know, it was, so it's, it was designed for women and, and they understood the message, even though it was not exclusively for women. But back in 2007, we had 3,000 members, now we have 11,000 members. Uh, so it's, that's, that's been going very well for us. Other measure is fan engagement on game day, uh, down at the stadium. And uh, we've, we've done very well there, we've been able to keep we, all of our tickets are, are essentially all of our tickets are season tickets. Uh, we've sold all our suites again this year. Um, we've sold almost all of our hospitality tents, which are these, if you ever come to our stadium, you'll see these corporate tents outside the stadium. Uh, and companies pay a, a, a good price to get those. They get tickets to the game with a, if they buy a tent. And that's, we've done very well with those as well. Um, we spend a lot of time worrying about the game day experience. Um, we will always, I always think that we're going to be successful if we have a good game day experience. Because if you can fill your stadium, keep your ticket prices up, sell your suites, 
then the sponsors will want to be with you because they see all the excitement around the stadium. So it's really critically important to keep your game day experience a good one. And we work really hard at this. Um, and so we, get, we do surveys, and we do surveys every year. We, do, we survey our fans a couple times a year at the games. Uh, but then we also, we, uh, the NFL did a league-wide survey because they're trying to focus also on how our team's doing because season ticket sales around the league are 5% loss of season ticket sales is a big deal. It is very, very, once you lose a season ticket holder, it is very difficult sometimes to get them back. Some teams have wait lists, but a lot of those wait lists are not real. Uh, they just are not real. Um, so you, if you lose a season ticket holder, you've lost something, I think. So 5% is a lot. So in, this, in the survey that the league did during the 2009 season, one of the questions they asked was overall satisfaction with the game day experience. And on our non-premium seats, the lower bowl and the upper bowl, we came out number four in the survey of 32 teams. The club seats, where we have refurbished the club seats, we've renovated them a lot over the last two and three years, uh, we were number one. It was a con overall satisfaction was measured as, a, as how, does the, how does the fan feel about the experience and the value he, and the price he's paying for the ticket. So it was a combination of, of price you're paying for the ticket and overall satisfaction with the experience. So those are, those are good numbers, but those numbers don't come cheaply. We have spent, we opened our stadium in 1998. <clears throat> this is our 13th year in the stadium. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about our stadium lease in a second. But essentially, in the last five years, we have spent $17.5 million trying to improve the game day experience. We've renovated our suite level. We've renovated the club level. Uh, we put in this past off season, if you're a fan and you've seen it, high definition, big screens uh, at each end of the stadium. Same old screens we always had, but we went high definition. Um, and we required new screens, but also a new control room. Very expensive. We put in uh, 550 new flat screen, high definition televisions all throughout the stadium. We'd already done that for the club level and the suite level, but we now did it throughout the concourses so the fans can watch our game when they go out to get uh, a hot dog, which is very expensive, by the way, or they go to the restrooms. They, have, they can at least watch the game while they're out there. I think that's been very well received. Um, um, then, you, then you come to the other measure of how you're doing is financially. So how are we doing financially? Well, you know, I, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but if you're looking... As I said, we're number 10 in the league in, terms of in, in 2009 in terms of aggregate revenue. But um, you know, if, you, if you're talking about return on investment, uh, this is not a good business for you to be in. It is simply not a good business. Um, you know, and, you know, I think we're, we're doing fine compared to other NFL teams, but the returns on investment for NFL teams are, n are not good. Um, you would not want to stand up in front of a, a group of financial analysts if you were a, a public company and talk about return on investment or return on equity. It would not, it would, the discussion would not go well. Just to give you an idea, you know, our, our Steve bought the team. He bought 49% of the team in uh, 2000. He then bought the balance. We had negotiated a, an option for him to, to buy the rest of the team in 2004 at a fixed price based on the valuation of, of uh, 2000. And um, since he became the controlling owner in 2004, we have not paid him a single dividend or made a single distribution to him. We take the money we generate and we put it back in the stadium. We buy players. Uh, we, we, buy, we bought this brand new castle that we built uh, in 2004 to house everybody. Um, and, and we pay down a little bit of debt. And that's, that's how we use our money. Um, so when, when people say, well, why did you buy a team? I, you know, they ask Steve. And I, thankfully, when I was representing Steve, I warned him no, this is not a good, if you want to make money, just take your money and put it in treasuries and you get a much better rate of return. And it would be risk-free, uh, as long as you stayed out of Greek bonds or, or Sp Spanish bonds or Irish bonds. If you did U.S. treasuries, you'd be fine. And you'd, do a lot, you'd make a lot more money than you would with an NFL team. Uh, he said he understood, and thankfully I said that to him. But I, I always, I tell people, uh, when you think about an NFL team, uh, you think about, investing in a beautiful painting, a Monet. And you buy it, you pay a lot of money for it, you put it up on your wall, you try to enjoy it, you get pleasure from it, uh, you get no return, current return from it, and you hope it appreciates in value. Uh, and that's how you have to think, um, and that's how I, at least in the case of the Baltimore Ravens, I think that's how you have to think of this investment. Um, 
So we talked a little bit about the challenges that the NFL is facing. What are the challenges the Baltimore Ravens face? Well, the principal challenge is the size of our market. We're the 26th largest market in the media market in the country. We are small. Uh, we're competing against all the big guys, and that uh, that's makes us at a disadvantage. It's a disadvantage because if you're a bigger market, it, it takes people with money to buy even a non-premium seat at our stadium. It's expensive to be a season ticket holder. And if you're a larger market, there's just more people with money. And so when you're a small market, you're, you know, the size of your, uh, of your potential uh, customers for your season tickets is just a lot smaller. It's even truer, of course, for premium seats. Um, and so that's a, that's a disadvantage. And then the media contracts you have, local television, local radio, they're not as valuable because radio, your radio station is not listened to by that many people, or certainly not compared to New York or Washington or Chicago or Dallas or any number of other cities. So uh, our local radio and television contracts are not as valuable as other teams are. Um, so the small market's a problem. It's an issue. It's something we have to, it's always a challenge we have to look at. Um, other problem with Baltimore is there's no, there's very, very few large companies. Headquarter companies tend to be the kinds of companies who spend on their local sports teams. Um, so in, in the entire Baltimore metropolitan area, there are five Fortune 1000 companies. Five. Um, you know, and the whole state of Maryland has 11, by the way. Six are in Montgomery County, and five are in the Baltimore metropolitan area. The Washington, D.C., the Redskins market, you know, they're up at, uh, they've got 25 Fortune 1000 companies. Philadelphia has 29. Richmond, Virginia, which is really a, a secondary market for the Redskins, has 12. Fortune 1000 companies. And it's not that Baltimore didn't have them, it's that there have been so many acquisitions. I mean, we used to, Black & Decker used to be the sixth company, and they were acquired by Stanley and Stanley Tool, and they've, their headquarters has been moved to Connecticut. So the lack of large corporate headquarters in Baltimore is an issue. We have fewer corporate headquarters, Fortune 1000 companies, than any other NFL city other than San Diego, which also has five. Um, <coughs> Another challenge for us is there's no secondary market. And what I mean by that is that if you're, um, take a, a team like Tampa Bay, we're the 26th largest uh, media market, they're number 14. So they're a much bigger media market to begin with. But there's Orlando, which sits uh, about a, an hour and 10 minute drive. Orlando is, is a little bit bigger than Baltimore. And there's no other team, and there's no football team in Orlando. So really, Tampa has a secondary market in Orlando that is a meaningful secondary market. There's, they have more Fortune 1000 companies in Baltimore. I think Orlando's maybe the 19th largest uh, media market. You got uh, teams like Cleveland, Cleveland, uh, Cleveland Browns. They've, they're a larger market than we are, but they also have Columbus, Ohio, which is really a fast-growing, dynamic uh, city and doing extremely well. So that. A lot of teams have secondary markets. Obviously, we have Washington, so we have no secondary market because that's Redskins territory. And if you go to the northeast a little bit, you have Philadelphia. Um, and then if you go to the west, you have the Steelers. So we, are, we have really almost not only do we have a small market, but we have no really available secondary market. So that's a, that's a bit of a challenge for us. Um, we also, another interesting challenge that I didn't really fully appreciate uh, was that Baltimore is a weak media market. Uh, and what I mean by that is that we have the Baltimore Sun, which is a great newspaper, has great traditions, but it's owned by the Tribune companies. The Baltimore Sun is in bankruptcy, as are all the Tribune newspaper companies. You measure the success of a newspaper in part, people tell me, by how heavy it is. Because that means if it's heavy, they got a lot of ads and they have a lot of revenue coming in. The Baltimore Sun is getting lighter and lighter and lighter. And um, you know, there's other big city newspapers, what they've, what they've had to do is to stop printing because it's very expensive to print a newspaper. So they'll maybe print once or twice a week and then you have to read it online. So the Baltimore Sun, you know, it, it, at one point was the largest daily circulation newspaper in Maryland. The Washington Post is now by far the largest daily circulation newspaper. A lot of our fans who live, hopefully some in PG County, Montgomery County, but certainly fans in Anne Arundel and Howard County, they tend to read the Washington Post, not the Baltimore Sun. And we go down and, and plead with the Washington Post to give us a beat reporter. And we had one, and then they got cutbacks, and our beat we lost our beat reporter. So we're not even covered in the Washington Post. They take a, an article from the Baltimore Sun about our game that they'll publish on Monday, but they don't give it any prominence. So it's, uh, we're really not covered. 
And then you have the way the television markets work. You have the Baltimore television stations. But if you live in Anne Arundel or Howard County or in Harford County, the way Comcast cable works, you get the Washington television stations. At least you get some of them. In Harford, you get at least Channel 5. Howard and Anne Arundel, I think you get all of them. So if you tend to be oriented towards Washington, you tend to watch the Washington television station. And if you watch the 11 o'clock news, the 6 o'clock news, they don't mention the Baltimore Ravens. It's all about the Redskins. So a lot of our fans, there's no way, it's no easy way for a fan to get news about the Ravens. That's one reason we spend a lot of money on our website, by the way. And if you're trying to pick up new fans, it's hard for them because if you're, you've just moved to Howard or Anne Arundel County, you're going to read the Washington Post, you're going to watch the Washington television stations, and you're there in our market, and we're having a hard time reaching you. So the weak media market in Baltimore is, a, is another challenge for us. Uh, the last challenge, and I'll spend a little bit of time on this later, is the fact that we are, uh, we're blacked out in our own market sometimes. And what I mean by that is, you know, the way the NFL rules work, if you don't sell all your tickets by Thursday before the Sunday game, you're blacked out in your own market. Your game is not carried in your local television market. But we sell out all of our games. But our marketing territory covers the entire state of Maryland other than Montgomery and PG County. So Frederick County is our territory. But Frederick County is part of the Washington television market. They don't get the Baltimore television stations. So if you're a Ravens fan and you live in Frederick County, you don't even get our games sometimes because the Washington stations do not always carry our games. 2009, we had three national games, meaning there were 13 games played on Sunday when we would be available to the Washington television market. They picked up nine of the games. They did not carry four of the games. So it's, uh, it's hard to build. The, the best way you build a fan base is through watching, people watching your games on television. And if you're not on television, it is extremely difficult. Um, the final challenge we have is we're a high expense team. Uh, we spend a lot of money. We spend, we have the, I think we have the best practice facilities in the NFL. That building is, will knock your socks off. We bring sponsors out there and they're sort of wowed by the boardroom and the offices and the, all the high tech stuff, the beautiful fields, the dining room. But it's expensive to operate that building. And uh, we, have a, we have an expensive stadium to operate and we pay for that. So we're a high expense team and we spend a lot of money on players. But having given you those challenges, let me tell you about what our advantages are because they are many. We've got, uh, one of the things we really have going for us, we have strong local ownership. That's a big deal. We, our owner owns 100% of the team. Um, and unlike other owners around, like, he does not live off the team. As I said, we don't give him anything. Uh, he, he draws a, a modest salary, a lot less than a lot of people in the building, believe me. And uh, that's it. He doesn't run his, you know, he's got, he's got the assets that a lot of very, very wealthy people have. He does not run them through the team. We don't pay for his yacht. Uh, we don't pay for his plane. Uh, we don't pay his family anything, and we don't make any distributions to him. So, it's a, so that's a big advantage we have. Um, Baltimore is a great football town. It's got the tradition of the Colts. It took us a while to engage the fan base. Uh, people who are my age, uh, some of them have never forg forgiven the Colts and gave up on the NFL, and it's taken a number of years to get a lot of those people back, but I think we've really won them back. Uh, I remember uh, I was one time a couple years ago, I was down on the field before we were playing the Steelers in a Monday night game in Pittsburgh, and Dan Rooney was down on the field, and he's now ambassador to Ireland, but then he was the controlling owner of, of the Steelers, and he was just, we were talking, he was just saying what a great rivalry the Ravens and the Steelers are and how much he appreciates it, and I said it is a great rivalry. And then he started talking about what the Steelers means, uh, what they, that team means to the city of Pittsburgh. And he was saying, you know, I knew that how important we are. If you walk around any place in the Pittsburgh area on a Monday morning, you will know whether the Steelers won or lost the day before. It's just obvious. Everyone knows. And that's what we're trying to build in Baltimore. And I think we're, we're getting there. In most of Baltimore, people really care about what we do. And that fan loyalty, that intensity, is what really drives our ticket sales and drives the fan engagement. So it helps us overcome these challenges. Um, Having a downtown stadium is a big advantage. As I said before, the game, day, the game day experience is critically important. Our stadium has very little parking, so which is good. You think that's a bad thing, and it is, doesn't help on the revenue side, but it's a good thing in the sense there's only 5,000 parking spaces in the vicinity of the stadium. So people park in the city, 
and walk in. Or they take light rail, which is right there. Or they take buses. 13% of our fans come by uh, mass transit. Uh, when our games are over, you look out to the parking lot, 15, 20 minutes, they're almost empty. Uh, you can live north of Baltimore and drive down and park your car if you have a parking permit, and you can leave your house you know, 35, 40 minutes before kickoff and be in your seat. There's very, very few NFL stadiums that have that. Uh, it's a big advantage. If you're a wealthy guy and you're spending a lot of money for a club seat and you have to spend two hours getting to the stadium and two hours getting out of the parking lot and then you're backed up in traffic for another hour, it's a full game. You know, your, your whole day is wrecked. And people don't want to do that. And that's why I think around the league you're seeing a lot of people having trouble selling their suites and their club seats because the game day experience is just not any fun. Uh, Baltimore, you know, dis despite what a lot of you may read about the city, is actually doing very, very well. In terms of demographics and jobs, Baltimore is doing well. People think of Baltimore as a blue-collar city. There's no blue-collar jobs left. They're all gone. But what's replaced them are a lot of, a lot of good jobs. Uh, Johns Hopkins is the largest employer, private employer in the state of Maryland. Uh, they're, they're really critically important um, to the city and to the surrounding area. Their hospital system has just been just done great things, and their biotech part they're building on the, on the east side. University of Maryland is critically important to Baltimore. They are the second largest employer in the city. They have got you know, great buildings on the west side, and they have built a biotech park. A lot of people are moving into the city. I, I don't ever get the stat completely right, but there is a, st a statistic out there that measures cities by how many people live within a mile radius of the center of the city. And Baltimore is like number four or five uh, in the country. And it's not people with no money. It's not people out there doing drugs. It's, it's uh, young professionals living in Federal Hill, Canton, uh, Fells Point, um, uh, Mount Vernon area. It's, uh, what's going on in Baltimore is actually very encouraging. Um, so I feel good about our city because we've been set back by the recession a little bit, uh, but it's starting to come back, and uh, a lot of the projects that were put aside, are they're, they're getting back on the boards. Um, also, the, there's good per capita income in Baltimore, uh, so that's also good. <clears throat> Finally, the other big advantage we have is we're in a good division. You know, to get to the playoffs, you, gotta win, you can win your division, you can be a wild card. When you think about our division, we have Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and Cincinnati. They're all, we all built stadiums about the same time. Uh, we're smaller than Pittsburgh, we're smaller than Cleveland, we're larger than Cincinnati, but we're all similar sized cities uh, with similar challenges. Um, and so I like, the f we're not competing against the New York Yankees and the Boston Red Sox. You know, we don't have the problem that, that some, some baseball teams have. I mean, so we're in a, we're in a good division, that helps us. Um, so anyway, bottom line for us as, a, as an organization, uh, we're doing well. We feel good about where we are. Uh, we're positive about where we are. It helps that we've been in the playoffs the last two years and we're fighting for the playoffs this year. Uh, so we're always, I think, going to be competitive and viable. I don't see anything happening in the next 10 years that's going to put us back at the bottom of the pack with, uh, with some other teams that are heading that way, clearly. Um, we're not, going to remain, we're not going to maintain our position as the 10th highest revenue team because we've been higher than the New York teams, but they'll, with their stadium next this year that they've just moved into, they'll, they'll pass us. But, but we're passing some teams that used to be ahead of us, and I, I, don't see that, um, I don't see that changing. Now, sometimes, you know, when you go around and you talk to business people, they say, well, okay, what's the difference between the Baltimore Ravens and any other business? And, and um, really, there's, I usually identify three things. One, one is that we are not running this business to maximize profits. If Steve Bashotti said to me, I, I wanna, I, I've got financial troubles and I want you to maximize profits, we would do things very, very differently. Uh, we would spend far less on players that we do. We would spend far less, far less on coaches. We would cut back on free meals for everybody. We would cut back on a lot of things we do. We'd cut off uh, capital expenditures for a while. We'd delay that. Uh, we're trying to ride a crest and get ahead of everybody to keep the momentum going. So we've been spending a lot on our stadium and on facilities. But if we had to maximize profits, we wouldn't do that. So that's a, that's a key difference, really. There's not many, uh, most, if you're a publicly held company, if you don't maximize profits, your board will probably get rid of you. Um, the other major difference is the level of public interest and scrutiny. It's, it's really remarkable. I mean, we are not a big company. We have 140 full-time employees plus the players. We've got, uh, you know, uh, $250 million in revenues. 
and yet everybody is following us. We've got, there are four sports talk radio stations in Baltimore. Here they are, the 26th largest media market, and there are four sports radio stations, and the only thing they talk about almost year round are the Baltimore Ravens. And it keeps everybody going. I mean, it's unbelievable. The, we have on any one day in our media room out at the facility when, we're, when the players are there practicing, we'll have upwards of 20 people, media people there covering us. Uh, th leading up to Steelers week, probably on f Thursday and Friday, we'll have more than that because it's a, it's a national game. It's on uh, Sunday night. So uh, when you're in the playoffs, the scrutiny just goes to another level. Everything that anyone says is transcribed. There's cameras all over the place. There's microphones all over the place. You know, you could be a, a, a $20 billion company and no one even knows you exist. I mean, I use Steve Bashotti's old company as an example. There was Alex Brown, largest investment banking firm there, didn't even know his company existed. So it's, it's just a unique, it's a unique situation in that regard. The other thing, the third thing that's different is we have a unique ability to unify a community. I mean, when we're doing well, it's amazing in the city of Baltimore how the fans get behind us, the city gets behind it. When we're in the playoffs, you know, the mayor puts up purple lights. That we, we're, our grounds crew comes down and takes Federal Hill and puts our logo on the side of Federal Hill. I mean, it's, uh, we, have, we have pep rallies downtown. Uh, you get in a cab and all the cab driver wants to talk about are the Ravens. It's just it's something that unifies a city that is really pretty amazing, actually, and, and gratifying. Uh, there's very few businesses that have, have the potential to do that. And if you do it right, you can have a really a very, very positive impact uh, uh, on, a, on a city. Let me, I, you know, what, what's the time like? We okay. Let me, let me just talk a little bit about, I want to talk a little bit about our, our, our stadium lease because we are owned, our stadium is owned by the Maryland Stadium Authority. And uh, before I was working for Steve, I read about that deal and I was a taxpayer, I live in Maryland, and I said, what the hell is going on here? Why are we building, why are the taxpayers building a stadium for an NFL team? And I actually, I was kind of irritated about the whole thing. Because then I read about what a sweetheart deal it was for the Models, and I said, this is ridiculous. Um, but let me, let me give you the other side of it, because I'm now totally biased, of course. <laughs> so whatever I'm going to say, you can just take with a grain of salt. But you know, you, you, I, I, what I, I'm very distrustful of, of these economic impact studies. Because an economic impact study is like so many things. It depends. You go to a guy and you, you tell him what you want, and they'll write it in such a way that you'll pretty much get, get what you want if you pay enough money. And so I don't, I don't really pay that much attention to them. There's some merit to them, uh, obviously, and there is an economic impact. But what I tried to do was just focus, okay, what are the direct tax revenues? So our stadium cost um, $220 million to build. That's what we got from the state of Maryland. We have put in a, probably another 50 million of our own. So, but the state put in $220 million. They don't pay any of the operating costs. The way our lease works is that we pay 100% of all operating costs, 100% of all maintenance, 100% of all game day experience, uh, of all game day expenses, like the ticket takers and all these guys that come around and work for us on game day. Uh, some of the employees you will see at the stadium are Maryland Stadium employees, but we reimburse them. We get a bill from them, we get an invoice from the Maryland Stadium Authority and we pay their, we pay not only their wages, but we also pay their benefits. Um, so there's no, the state of Maryland doesn't pay for anything down at the stadium on a on going forward basis. They made the initial investment of $220 million. If you figure, and I don't know what the interest rate on those bonds now is, but let's say it's 3%. I doubt it's more than 3%. Uh, that's that's $6.6 .6 million a year in interest payments. So what I said to myself, okay, what do we pay in direct taxes to the state of Maryland? Uh, remember, this is a but-for stadium. But-for the stadium, the Baltimore Ravens would not be in Baltimore. The Cleveland Browns never would have, would have come uh, to Baltimore unless there is an agreement from the state of Maryland, Maryland to build a stadium. So this is a, a but-for stadium. Uh, and so I, I looked at, okay, what do we pay in payroll taxes, I'm sorry, in income taxes to the state of Maryland? We, have, we don't have that many people working for us. We have the 140, but we also have those 53 guys who are making a hell of a lot of money. So what, what do we pay uh, in, in, in that? So I took that tax. The other thing I looked at was our ticket tax. Uh, our total gross gate last year was $66 million. We paid 10% tax to the state of Maryland, so $6.5 million right there. Then I looked at the sales tax on concession sales just at the stadium, nothing else. 
I looked at the parking tax just for parking at the stadium for Ravens games. I'll talk about other events in a second. So I took those numbers. Uh, last time I did this was 2008. That direct tax number was $17 million. So, you know, I think, you know, you can work the numbers any way you want, but that's a, that's a significant difference between the interest payment. I know that's not paying down the principal, but we're not even talking yet about the economic impact we have, nor are we talking about the other events that we attract to the city. Um, so I think that, and we're not talking about also the benefits that I think the team brings to the city. So I think that from a, and if you're looking at it strictly as an investment, I think Maryland made a good investment actually. Um, let me, last thing I want to talk about are the Redskins in our territory. Because uh, I know I got a lot of Redskins fans out here. And I know one time they put, a, they put one of our games on a television and one of my neighbors came over and said, why are, the Ra you know, why are the Ravens on television in Washington? He, he was outraged. Uh, but it's a big issue for us. And uh, there, there's two types of territories in the NFL. There's a marketing territory and a television territory. The marketing territory is where you get to use your marks and logos. So M&T Bank's our bank sponsor. We can, we can take their marks and logos anywhere in our, and they can use our marks and logos anywhere in our ter marketing territory. Our marketing territory is defined by the NFL as the entire state of Maryland except for Montgomery and PG County. And Montgomery and PG County is Redskins territory, and they have all of Northern Virginia, and they also have Washington, D.C. Um, so that's, that's fine. That, that works out okay for us. We're, that, you know, they, we could maybe get a, an, a compromise with them at some point, but that's okay. The bigger problem for us, really, uh, is the television issue. Um, not having our games, all of our games on in Washington is a big, big problem. And the way the rule, the, the thinking about the system is this. If you're the Washington Redskins and you're home at 1 o'clock, there should be no other NFL game broadcast into your, in that 1 o'clock window when you're playing at home. So that seems fair. Uh, I understand that. The problem is when we're home at 1 o'clock, the Redskins games are broadcast into our territory over Comcast uh, roughly in a 50% of our territory. So we, have, we don't have that protection. They have that protection. So it's a... Uh, Anyway, we're, we're fighting that battle. I mean, those are, those are the kinds of issues we, we go up. I was, I've been telling Mark, I mean, from the day one, I've, I've been up to the NFL every year, sometimes twice a year, complaining about the television situation because it's not fair that our fans can't see all of our games when they live sometimes literally 16 miles from our stadium. They can't get our games. I mean, we, have, we do have students at the University of Maryland. I mean, fans at the University of Maryland. And it's, it, a lot of our fans here at the University of Maryland cannot see our games. I just think that's ridiculous. It's something we're working on. Anyway, I'd be happy to take some questions. How you doing? Um, I assume that uh, if you can't get viewership um, because of the TV rights, uh, doesn't the NFL network or, uh, I mean, when you pay for NFL uh, package, I would assume that, that each team... You can, buy, you can go, you can get satellite television, you can get direct TV package and get our games that way, yeah. yeah. But that's expensive. It's, uh, what, $240, I think, for the season. And you're not allowed to just to buy one team's games. But I assume that, that there's some sort of... Uh, I guess residual or, or payment given to all the teams as a as a it's shared thirty two ways shared thirty two yes, ways yeah. shared thirty two ways yeah okay yeah go ahead I can probably hear you go ahead the you know the uh, the Sunday night games are now streamed uh, on NBC it's the only one that does it and you know one of the big issues facing the NFL is delivery of games and how are we you know the technology is changing so quickly but the the networks of course don't want that um, right now so um, you know the current television contracts most of them expire in 2014 and I think in the next round of negotiations one of the issues obviously a key issue is going to be uh, streaming the games over the internet um, but I'm not sure we could capture the same revenue. Um, one of the commitments we've always made to Congress is that our games, unlike any other sports league, all of our games are available over the free over the air. 
So uh, we'd have to deal with that issue as well. So even when our games are on uh, ESPN on cable, um, in the local markets, we have to have a separate contract so they're broadcast over the air in the, in the, in the local market. And when the games are carried on, ESP, on uh, NFL Network on Thursday night, we have to make those games available over the air in the, lo in the two markets where the teams are from. So the internet, but, but the whole technology and what we're going to do with that is going to be a big issue going forward, which has not been resolved yet. I've seen, I've been to games where the, uh, both the Redskins and the Ravens have played the Steelers, and I think each team has created great passion. Although what's interesting when I go to these games, at the Redskin games, I see a lot more fans of different colors there, where at the Ravens games, I see you know 95% in right. purple. And in, any comment on that? And then I have a follow-up. Well, you know, I think we try really hard to keep those terrible towels out of our stadium. <laughs> but you can't, you know, we figured, okay, could we just ban them? And, and so they, if they come to the gate, we we'll say we're going to confiscate your towel. But that's not legal, so we couldn't do that. So the only thing you can do is try to have a good, good enough team and a good enough experience that your fans don't want to sell their tickets. Now, the other side of that is I'm very sympathetic to the fans. It's a, t it's a lot of money to be a season ticket holder. And so when we, in 2008, we played the NFC East. Um, was the, the division we played from the, uh, from the NFC. So we had home games, regular season home games against the Redskins and the Eagles. And then we were also playing the Steelers. We played them at home every year. If you're a season ticket holder and you'd sold your tickets to two of those three games, you'd pay for the rest of the season. So that's, what, that's really what happens. You know, I, I, you know, so when we play the Steelers, I'll be watching Sunday night. I'm going to be watching how many yellow tickets. They don't come out until they do something good. But they always do something good. So when they do something good, you'll see the, you'll see the yellow towels. And I, I can't count them, but you get a sense. You know, I remember one game in uh, 2005 where we were not doing very well, and they were doing very well. Uh, there were a lot of yellow towels. It was, it's deeply disturbing. <laughs> no, I, and I mean it just because it's, 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 uh, it's dispiriting, because you're trying. It really means you're, you're doing something wrong. It's not so much that they're there yelling, at, and that's obnoxious and unfortunate. But it really means you're doing something wrong, and you, because they're there, and so you know if I if I look out, they'll probably be, you know, I, my guess is they'll be somewhere between five and ten percent of the fans at the game, and if we do well, you won't see many uh, yellow towels because as the game goes on, they they sort of keep them at the side, you know, and put them away. But um, it's it's really it's the teams you, you, you got to have a good enough thing going on that people won't sell their tickets. Second comment, you made, a, you made a point about employment. And uh, just, a, again, looking for your opinion, if you take yourself back, you know, a lot of the kids in the 20s, and I have a son that age, people who have passion about sports want to break into the industry. Yeah. And what area, you talked about employment, not people, not hiring, would they go to work for, you know, try to go to work for an Under Armour? Would it be a sponsor? Would it be a team? Would it be a, a law firm? Would it be an accounting firm? Where do you see the opportunities in sports? There's a lot of, you know, if you're talking about the NFL and you want to work uh, with the NFL, either for a team, um, I always tell people you're better off doing something else for a while, getting a well-grounded background in something, and then trying to jump. You know, Mark worked in television for a long time, and he worked, went to the NFL, and I was a lawyer for a long time. You probably don't want to be a lawyer as long as I was a lawyer. That's too long. But, I mean, but, but like accountants, we, fire, you know, we do hire accountants. Um, we have a finance department. There's people, uh, we hire writers uh, who write for the website. Uh, we hire guys who are good with video because we have a lot of, just like this thing, we do a lot of, we have to create a show at the stadium for the big boards, and then we produce uh, five television shows a week during the season. And we do all that in-house. And so it requires a lot, of, a lot of people with different talents. But I always think you're better off getting, you know, if you can get an internship, that's fine. But those are really, really hard to get. And a lot of them are not very good internships, in, in my view. I mean, it's, it's good because it looks good on the resume, and it can lead to something else. But the actual experience sometimes is not that good. Depends on the department and what's going on that year. But I think you know, it, it's, it's too narrow a, a job. There just aren't enough job openings. Um, I would think you're better off doing something else for a while. Some guys who work for the teams came through the league office. Um, the league has a lot of employees. Some people came through the networks. Um, there's just a lot of different ways of doing it. Some guys are scouts. You know, and most of our scouts are guys who uh, played Division Three football and love football. They're not Division One players. They don't have that talent, but they wanted to stay in football. So we hired them. Uh, Ozzy calls them 2020 guys. 
Uh, Ozzie Newsom's our general manager. And a 2020 guy is someone who gets paid 20,000 a year and works 20 hours a day. It's, it's an exaggeration. <laughs> but it, it's, it's something like that. And you sort of work your way up. And you're in the building for being basically a gopher for two years. Your third year, uh, you'll get to go out on a couple of scouting things. And you drive the players around. You pick them. The guys who are trying out, you go drive the car out to the airport. You pick them up and you bring them back. And you listen to what they're saying, because that's important, of how they talk. And we interview uh, under the NFL rules. When, when we get ready for the draft, we're allowed to bring in 30 college students who are eligible for the draft to interview them at the building. And we always send our young guys out to bring them in, because they sometimes say revealing things just talking. And it's also, we, we talk to the young guys who are driving out just to see, OK, what are they like? Are they nice guys? Were they respectful? You know, did, you know that sort of thing. Um, so there's that, there's that job track as well. Yes. Uh, a lot of teams now have decided to go with uh, privately funding their stadiums instead of using public funding to move up that Forbes list. Uh, do you see this trend continuing, and is there any downside? Well, I, I think you know the, the it, most teams would obviously prefer public money if they could get it. But it, there's you know you, like in California, the three worst stadiums in the NFL are all in California, and each one of those stadiums is is falling down and needs to be. Uh, redone or rebuilt or a new stadium. But California has no money. You can't possibly ask the state of California to do anything. So it, they have to be privately funded. Um, other jurisdictions are willing to spend the money because they think it's a good investment. Um, but the private funding is, is it's hard right now simply because the debt markets are so tight. It's hard to borrow that kind of money because um, it's somewhat risky. Um, but I do see that more and more money, you know, it's, most of the stadiums are built are actually jointly funded by the public and by private. Like Dallas's new stadium, I think um, they got $375 million from the state, city, and the rest was private. So I think that kind of combination is, is, is what really the, the model tends to be now. Yes. The oldest player. <laughs> I mean, no, the uh, a player contracts, uh, you know, we have uh, this collective bargaining agreement has a form contract attached to the back of it. So it's a, it's a total form. We even worked out forms for all the incentives. Uh, so the only thing that's complicated sometimes are the high first round picks. And one of the issues in the collective bargaining process now is to come up with a rookie wage scale which will limit what the rookies get. And if that were to occur, those contracts would become even more simple than the other ones. So um, there's really, the contracts are simple. The negotiations can sometimes be complex. But you know, the way it's done, it's not unlike other businesses. If you, you look at comparables, and so let's say you're trying to sign a, a free agent wide receiver, and you say to yourself, well, this guy is sort of like Mr. X. Mr. X got five years and five million a year. Uh, he's not as good as Mr. Y, who got seven million, so he's closer to five. And you know, so you try to find comparables. Um, and it's important not to overpay, because if you overpay, then you don't have money, because there's a salary cap, you don't have enough money then for other players. Uh, in terms of the player I'm, I'm closest to, you know, I'm not really that close. I don't, none of them is my friend. I mean, I'm, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, I'm like their father. I mean, I'm like their grandfather almost. I mean, so it's, you know, it's, I don't know their music. I don't, you know, uh, you know, it's just a very different. I mean, remember, a lot of the guys we get are, are 22, 23, 24 year old young men. Um, what I do try to do, I mean, it, what's interesting about it when you think about the guys we get, and you, maybe some of you saw the movie The Blind Side or read the book The Blind Side, and we have. Um, we have players who come from, some come from difficult backgrounds, and they come from a college environment where everything is done for them. You know, they live in a dorm, their meals are provided. Uh, they come to Baltimore, and we have to help them get a driver's license, have to get them a checking account. Some of them never had a checking account before. We have to help them find housing. They've got to go find an apartment or a townhouse, someplace to live. Uh, we have to tell them about the gun rules. Because a lot, of, a lot of young men come from the South where you can carry guns, or they have a gun permit. And you come to Maryland, and they, you know, they don't understand why you can't have a gun in your car. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of issues that they have to deal with. It's almost it's a very um, 
know, it's a, it's a difficult issue for some of these young guys to adjust to live. And then they got to figure out, where am I going to eat? Where am I going to get dinner? Now, we serve three meals a day uh, during the season. Uh, almost four days a week, we serve three meals a day for the players. But on those other days, they've got to go, and you really don't want them to go to Popeye's every night. Uh, so you have to, they have to learn how to eat, how to prepare food, how to get, buy furniture. Um, you know, it's how to get their laundry done. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a major adjustment which we work hard at doing. Yes? I think, you know, if you're going to build a stadium with private money, the only way to get it done is personal. For you, those of you who don't know, a personal seat license is a, it's basically a contract that entitles you to buy season tickets for the next 30 years for a particular seat in a stadium. And like Dallas Cowboys and the Giants and the Jets have sold personal seat licenses for their new stadiums. And most, a lot of the money they've raised to, to pay off the, the debt of the construction is from personal seat licenses. And so you could buy a, a personal seat license for $20,000 for one seat. And then you have to turn around and buy the season tickets every year. So if you buy four tickets, you've got to come up with $80,000. I, uh, I think on all the new stadiums, I think personal seat licenses will be part of the package. Uh, I do think that yes. I don't. I don't see how. I don't see how to get around it. Yes. Well, you know, you mean when we're drafting and, and looking at free agents and the like. Yeah, we uh, we do both. You know, I think um, our general manager has a he uh, is Ozzie Newsom, who is he's a Hall of Fame football player. Went to the University of Alabama, played for the Cleveland Browns his entire career first African-American GM in the National Football League, and he's very, very good at what he does. And um, he is, um, you know, he really does a combination. We care very much how fast they are, how high they can jump, and how strong they are, and also how smart they are. Um, but we also care a lot about what kind of person they are. Do they get along? You know, we go into the, our scouts will go to a college, and they'll want to talk to the people who spend the most time with the players, like their position coaches, the trainer, the equipment manager, and how do they act around the trainer and the equipment manager? Do they show them respect? Um, do they work hard in the weight room? I mean, that's another, what's their work ethic like? So all those intangibles are very, very important. And then, obviously, you've got to look at game tape. Um, our scouts go to games and watch particular players, but they also have uh, all the game tape is now digital, so you can just order it up on a computer. And uh, they look at hours and hours and hours and hours of game tape. Before we draft a guy uh, high in a high up, you know, one through first through third round, uh, typically we'll, we will have interviewed him either at the combine or at our facility or both. We will have talked to a lot of people who know him very well. Uh, we will have gone through his data, his his Wonderlick test, and how high he can jump and all that. We probably went to a personal workout because in addition to the combine, <laughs> later on there's you can go to a college workout and see the players there. Um, but, but tape is also very important, how they perform in a game. So it's, it's really a combination. Um, yes? I know you were a lawyer for many years. What, what was your reaction to the American Legal decision? You know, um, I, I was a, a little surprised by that, honestly. Uh, the American Needle decision was, it's a, should I get into, I mean, it's, it's, it's but anyway, it was a, um, it's a, it's a question of when, uh, it was a hat company and the hat company had a license with the NFL to produce hats that, that bore NFL logos and team logos. They lost their license, and the NFL went with another couple other companies. And the company then sued the NFL uh, for violation of the antitrust laws, alleging it, was, uh, it violated Section 1 of the Sherman Act, which is as an unreasonable restraint of trade. And, um, you know, I thought the, the NFL won in the lower courts at the district court level and the circuit court, as I recall, and then lost in the Supreme Court. And the irony of the situation is that the lawyers for American Needle appealed to the Supreme Court, filed for certiorari. It means you don't have a right to appeal to the Supreme Court. You ask the Supreme Court to take the case because there's a conflict in the circuits or some other reason. Because you couldn't argue this was a case of national importance because it's, it's hats. But um, the NFL, thinking it was going to win, uh, agreed with the hat company that the Supreme Court should take the case. And then the NFL lost the case, badly, actually. It's hard to put a good spin on it. 
It was just a, it was a big loss, I think. You know. All it meant to the NFL is that we get sued all the time by similarly situated companies. If we had won the case, we could win, we could win it on summary judgment or on a motion to dismiss. When you lose the case, it then becomes a fact-finding mission. Was it an unreasonable restraint of trade? The American Needle case will go back down to the district court. I'm pretty confident the NFL will win at the district court when it goes to trial, but then you, you're going to have to spend millions of dollars defending it. So that was why the NFL wanted to get a definitive ruling. we got time for two more questions. Yes. What, what, how are the economics um, that out for, the merch, for merchandising, for, for NFL merchandising? One to the, to the, to the, team the way it works in the NFL is there's two types of there's two ways you can get money from the sale of merchandise. One is, one is uh, you, every company that has a license from the NFL when they sell product at wholesale they have to pay a royalty to the NFL. That so let's say that uh, Walmart is buying Dallas Cowboys jerseys, they have to pay they buy it from a from a manufacturer at wholesale. Uh, the license, the uh, the license uh, e who bought who manufactured the goods has to give 10% of that wholesale price to the NFL, not to the Dallas Cowboys, but to the NFL. That money is then shared equally 32 ways. But then each team, in its own market, we can buy product at wholesale and sell it at our stadium, or we can hire a, a company to sell it at our stadium, and then that money is our money. So whatever you sell in your local market is is yours. But even then, if you go out to a shirt company because you want a you know a golf shirt with a Ravens logo and you want to sell it at a golf shop or something, we have to go. We the Ravens have to go to an NFL licensee and we have to pay a royalty, and that royalty then goes to the league and is shared 32 ways. Last question. Yes. Um, in all your years as a lawyer. It's not that many years. <laughs> in your prior experience. Yes. What do you find most useful in helping you be successful in your current position? That assumes I am successful, but I, let's assume that. But, I, let, you know, I think, um, I always think the, the ability to listen to people, uh, really listen carefully, because no one knows everything, and you have to learn, and you, you learn stuff every day. And the ability to listen and not sort of prejudge things uh, is, I think, is so important. I mean, because you come in, everyone, all of us comes to an issue or an, a problem with sort of a, a notion of what it, how it should come out. And it's always interesting, and, and usually, you know, if you've been around a long time, usually it comes out close to what you thought. But there are, there are times, and important times, when it doesn't. And, and if you listen, you really, you really can you learn a lot. And so I think someone, at least in my position, it's very important to listen and very important to encourage people to tell you things. Sometimes people don't like to come and tell you things. They think it's better you not know or you don't need to know this. Um, and it's not because there's anything wrong. They just don't want to bother you with it, and then it, that's. But if they do come, you have to listen, and I think that's really important. Thank anyway, you. Thank you very much. <laughs>